Hi everyone, thank you for uh, clicking on to this uh, little video. Um, do apologise in advance. Um, I'm having all sorts of problems with my computer and uh, my uh, brother um, brought me a, an amazing uh, microphone which I just doesn't seem to be working um, uh, right now um, on my laptop. I, I'm not very tech savvy, um, so apologies for the background noise you might hear um, from the laptop. Wherever you, wherever you are right now, uh, whatever life is doing for you or to you, or with you, I pray God's peace, God's compassion to be upon you. I pray that you may know it and feel it and trust it because it really is there with you. God's peace be with you. So I want to talk uh, in this little film about the parable of the talents, which is our gospel reading for the 33rd Sunday uh, of year A. <clears throat> a parable of the talents. Before I do that, a um, little bit of history which might help us to uh, understand something of the surrounding and context of this story. In the year 4 BC, the son of Herod the Great, Archelaus, went on a trip to Rome. Archelaus wanted to succeed his father as king of the Jews. Now, many Jews were not wildly enthusiastic about this prospect. Uh, the ancient Jewish historian Josephus tells us that Archelaus massacred and murdered with the same Elan as his father. Well, anyway, uh, to succeed his father as king, Archelaus had to go to Rome to get the approval and support of God himself, Caesar Augustus. Before he left, Archelaus trusted his property and his wealth to his servants and supporters. But while he was still travelling, a delegation of Jewish leaders sent a counter-petition to Caesar Augustus, begging him to appoint Archelaus as king. So if you were in Israel in about 4 BC, you didn't know uh, who would come back as king. Uh, which side do you support? Pick the wrong side and there will be consequences. In the end, Archelaus won Caesar's approval. And so when Archelaus returned from his journey, what do you think he did to those who backed his rival or who just sat on the fence and hedged their bets? Spoiler alert, he massacred them, he punished them. Josephus tells us that uh, 3,000 Pharisees alone were slaughtered by Archelaus. In our Gospel today, the parable of the talents, Jesus tells a story about a ruler who goes away on a journey, entrusts his wealth to his servants, and when he comes back, he wants to know who has been loyal and who has not, and what have people done with his stuff. Sound familiar? Who could that be about? Everyone hearing Jesus' story would have known exactly what the reference was. They'd have known that he was referring to the real life story of Archelaus, a ruler who journeys away and returns with rewards and punishment. So what is Jesus saying to us by retelling this story? Um, that God is like Archelaus, work hard, watch out, invest? No, obviously not. Given what we know about God and the God we see revealed to us in Jesus on the cross, um, he is a God of non-violent, all-forgiving compassion. Um, so that cannot be uh, the reading, the right reading of this parable. You see, all scripture, all our interpretations of scripture must bow to Jesus the crucified and risen God. You need to read this parable and all scripture through that lens. And besides, no ancient listener or reader would have thought that Jesus was offering a simple morality story in this parable, commending the actions of Archelaus or the um, servants who supported him. Read on a service level, you have an undoubtedly evil king you have servants who work for him and who are therefore complicit in his evil. And you have one servant who refuses to lend or play along uh, in this vile charade. 
And that one servant who does nothing with uh, the talent of wealth that uh, the ruler leaves with him, he's obviously the hero. He is the good guy. He's like, if you're the dealer, I'm out of the game. And you can read this parable as a story commending to us heroic resistance on the part of the non-compliant servant, the whistleblower, who calls out the vileness of this corrupt king. That works. That tells us the story of, of prophets and um, heroes and saints and servants throughout history. God can speak to us if we read the parable in that way. There are times when Christians can and should call out their violence and corruption that everyone else is just fine with. If you're the dealer, I'm out of the game. But wisdom literature, all great literature, and especially scripture, doesn't speak with just one voice. It's, um, it has many ways of speaking to us. And I just want to I'm just I'm just struck by the fact that Jesus often loves to illustrate his message, not with stories of pious and holy people, but with stories about crooks, loathsome kings, dishonest servants, violent gangs of grape pickers and families having a total breakdown. Parable of the prodigal son. And Jesus will often begin these stories by saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. Heaven is like this. And we're like, wait. What? Why does Jesus do that? Why does he write with crooked lines? Well, one reason is because God knows the mess we're in. God knows um, the world we live in and how sometimes, maybe often, that world is dirty and corrupt and violent. God knows. And God is present within that world as redeeming justice and fierce mercy. And Jesus is also daring us to look into the most awful and messy and tragic of stories and see in them refracted patterns of heaven's redeeming power. So let's give this a go. Look into this messy, corrupt, violent story um, for a... Um, a, 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 a wisdom message, a subversive wisdom message about uh, heaven's redeeming power, maybe refracted in the story of these awful characters. And in this, I'm completely indebted to um, uh, Bishop Robert Barron, um, his insight uh, into this um, and what he shares with us is just uh, stunning. And you might as well just watch his video on this or read his blog post on this because it says it all much better than I can. But he, his insight is this, that Jesus uses the real life story about a vile and corrupt king to talk to us about the nature of divine mercy. It's unfortunate that talent is our word for a gift or skill that someone might have. But there is a richer and deeper meaning we miss if we don't understand what a biblical talent was. An ancient talent was a measurement of serious wealth, like a block of gold or silver. A talent measured heavy wealth. One talent weighed a lot. Two or five were extremely heavy. Now, heaviness, heaviness would have brought to mind something that fascinated uh, uh, rabbinic teachers and scholars uh, in Israel. For they spoke of the kabod of Yahweh, the heaviest reality of all, the glory of God, the presence of God himself, that awesome weighty presence and reality was found in the temple. And where specifically in the temple was that deep, heavy, weighty treasure found? Over the mercy seat. The mercy seat, the place in the temple where divine compassion was given. In other words, what is the great gift, the heaviest treasure, the talent that 
anyone could be given? Divine mercy, divine compassion. Receiving that talent is a participation in the inexhaustible, depthless reality of divine mercy. And here's the thing, like a monetary talent, this talent is meant to be kept in circulation, passed on, invested so it accumulates value. Divine compassion is pure gift. We don't earn it. Most of the time we don't deserve it, but it's received as pure gift. And so it has to be passed on as pure gift. And in the economy of grace, the economy of heaven, the more mercy you receive, the more you pass on, and the more you pass on, the more you receive. It has this dynamic power of growth, inflation, and expansion. But this divine talent can't be possessed. It only exists in gift form. You can't have it or own it or grasp it, or bury it. If you try, it just evaporates. It's a, re a relational reality. In the last verse of the parable, the wicked ruler says to the servant who kept his one talent and buried it, take away what he has and give it to those who have, because to those who have, more will be given. But to those who have not, even what they have will be taken away. Now, in the field of economics, that principle, that voice is from Satan. It's from hell. Take from the poor, those who don't have, and give to the rich, those who already do have. That's what the world does. And it's a principle that comes straight from hell. But in the economy of heaven, in the kingdom of love, to those who have, more will be given, but to those who don't, even what they have will be taken away. That's the voice of grace. And it's not that grace is being vindictive or mean towards those who don't have. It's just how the spiritual physics works. If you think you can possess pity and compassion for yourself, receive it yourself and not pass that on, you're in for a shock. Because you'll find that when you try to cling to it, it disappears and you have nothing. The heaviest, weightiest reality of all, divine compassion, it, it, it's weighty, it always comes down. It always comes right down. Well, it disappears in the heart of the one who refuses to share it. God is not Archelaus. The parable of the talents is not Jesus saying all that Sermon on the Mount stuff, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the poor, uh, blessed are those who love their enemies. Yeah, forget all that. Work hard, start a business, invest for success. You know, that's spoiler alert, not the gospel. No, the parable of the talents is Jesus declaring the urgent, life-giving truth about the heaviest and weightiest talent of all, divine chesed, compassion, the weighty gift that is given to you and me. And the more screwed up you are, the more you're given, as sin abounded, grace abounded even more. Understand what you've been given. Those who are forgiven much, love more, says the irresponsible Jesus. The more you need, the more you're given. But understand what you've received and pass it on. Don't sit on this talent. It'll just evaporate if you try. When our children were little, we used to sing a song about the magic penny. Love is like a magic penny hold it tight and you won't have any but lend it spend it you'll have so many they'll roll all over the floor for love is something if you give it away you end up having more 
I suppose Jesus could have declared this urgent truth by using a sweet and lovely song like that. But he pre preferred to tell it through a dark, noirish tale about a bandito called Archelaus. The Lord is like that. He speaks to us from the mud, from the depths, from a rubbish dump called Golgotha. He speaks from there to tell us about mercy. As the starrets Lenny Cohen says, you want it darker? Hinane, Hinane, I'm ready, my lord. <laughs>